Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, my very biased collection, as usual. Today, uh, not really a theorem. In the end, there will be a theorem. There will be the first ever found NP-complete problem. We'll see what that means. But basically, I would like to waffle a little bit, ramble about P versus NP and whatever that means and how I think about it and why I like chairs a lot. Why do I like chairs? Well, if you want to know why I like chairs, stay tuned. And yeah, so there's a very beautiful article, which I link in the description, um, which makes some really good points. And I'm kind of following that idea, uh, slightly, slightly unique exposition of P versus NP. So it already starts slightly unique because I kind of claim that the P versus NP goes back to Hilbert. So there is this famous speech of Hilbert, so Hilbert's 23 problems from 1900. And don't get confused. I just took this picture here. This is definitely Hilbert. Okay. Yeah. But this is far away from being 1900. I just thought it, it looks a little bit like Hilbert is lecturing. So I just put it here and there's a one plus one in the background. That's already a good uh, indication. That's already a good idea. Really, really good to, to take this uh, picture. Actually one plus one, who doesn't like one plus one? Um, point is, I wasn't actually able to find any picture from 1900 at Hilbert. So uh, who would have guessed that people 120 years ago uh, wouldn't have taken their cell phones and made pictures of everything? Who would have guessed that? Maybe also I haven't looked carefully enough. But anyway, I wasn't really able to find a picture. So I decided to go with Hilbert standing in front of, I have no idea what it is. And it looks like Hilbert is lecturing, um, but it's just way later. Anyway, so here's Hilbert's grave. Uh, with the famous uh, phrase, wir müssen wissen, wir werden wissen. So um, basically, we must know, we shall know. Um, that's a cool phrase on, on your gravestone, I guess. Uh, so Hilbert's gravestone. Anyway, this was a digression here. Uh, so back to Hilbert. So Hilbert's famous speech in 1900. And one of the problems, which I'm not going to recall here, it takes us too far off the track, was basically the question, is there a purely mechanical procedure, huge quotation marks, to check statements, huge quotation marks. Um, and the P versus NP problem is a modern refinement of Hilbert's question, basically. So I kind of claim that, well, following this idea in this article, that the P versus NP problem goes back to goes back to Hilbert. It took a long time. So later, uh, when people try to formalize cryptography, so after the Second World War, cryptography really became extremely important as, as a field. People tried to formalize it, um, its foundations and so on. And then people like John uh, Nash came up with problems along the same uh, line. And then eventually in the 70s, uh, the problem crystallized itself and became what it is nowadays. Uh, but maybe actually it goes back to Hilbert, probably goes back even further. Um, but anyway, so basically it is the problem uh, as trying to answer Hilbert's question. Is there any fast way, whatever that means, to address all questions with mechanically verifiable answers? Okay, so that's kind of the P versus NP question. And the answer to it is absolutely not, but we don't know. So let me zoom in a little bit and give you a little bit more details on P versus NP without going too technical. So the whole point is there are a lot of technicalities, which I'm completely ignoring. Um, because just to phrase it logically correct is a bit painful. So you have to specify what kind of computers you like to talk about, what kind of algorithms, what kind of machines. In the end, it's only about a certain form of Turing machine. So certainly not about any kind of computer in particular. And that's one of the big criticisms about P versus NP anyway. You definitely exclude uh, analog computers, biological computers, and quantum computers. So it's basically only about digital computers and not even really about digital, digital computers. It's about certain types of Turing machines. Anyway, it was a long waffle. There are a lot of technicalities involved, but kind of the main ideas are the point. So let's focus on the main ideas. So there are two complexity classes, and one of them is a subset of the other. So that's easy to see. And I call them, well, I certainly also call them P and NP, but they are called P and NP. And NP is just saying there is a certain type of problem and it is very easy to check that you have a solution um, and there is a brute force way to get a solution. So there is a way to get a solution and it's easy, right? Easy, you see the point. Easy to check that you have a solution, right? So you have a brute force approach to get one and it's easy to check whether you have one. With contrast, 
for the P, it's actually even easy to find the solution, right? So for NP, I'm just saying you can get one some solution if you have really brute force, but for P, it's actually easy to find the solution. So here's my example. So I have two examples. Um, a, a jigsaw puzzle is an NP problem. Why is a jigsaw puzzle an NP problem? Well, you certainly can get some solution somehow, and it's definitely non-trivial in most cases, but it's very easy to check whether your solution is a solution. You just stare at the jigsaw and you say, yeah, it is. So jigsaw is certainly an NP problem. And sorting turns out, that's not quite trivial, actually. Sorting turns out to be um, a P problem because it can actually do it very efficiently using, for example, quicksort, whatever that is, um, in n squared time. So n is the number of objects you want to sort. And it's th therefore also, first of all, of course, easy to check whether you have a solution. You just look at your numbers and see whether they're in order or not. But it's also easy to find the solution. So sorting is actually in P. And note that I don't make any statement about jigsaw, whether jigsaw is in P or not, uh, because it would require some analysis of its complexity, which I'm not going to do. I'm just saying jigsaw is an NP, right? So it's clear that jigsaw is an NP because, as I said, you can check easily that it has a solution. This is exactly this point of uh, with mechanically verifiable answers, right? But you can also get a solution. In the worst case, you just list all possibilities of trying to put your little puzzle pieces together and just do it, right? The brute force approach. And the main question is then, is this complexity clause of things that are solvable, not necessarily easy, we don't know, but easily to check whether there is a solution, and the uh, part of problems that are easy to solve, are they the same? So it's P equals NP. And the answer is no, obviously not. So roughly the analogy here is that's where the chairs come. Um, so if P is N NP, then it's roughly the same as that if you can recognize a chair, you can build one, right? So if you can recognize a chair, it's immediately clear that you can build one. Um, in more mathematical terms, if you can check that there is a solution easily and you also get a solution easily, that's obviously completely wrong. But the problem is we just can't verify that. It's one of these very annoying problems, which is obviously wrong. I mean, but you still can't do anything about it, right? So recognizing a chair is definitely not the same as building a chair. I think I can recognize a chair, maybe. I don't know, maybe, but I certainly can't build a chair. So it, it seems to be a very different, but you still can't prove it, which is very, very annoying. It's a very annoying state of the arts. And what are the NP complete problems? Well, the NP complete problems are those that are harder than all the others. So they're the problems that you can use to simulate every other NP problem. So basically what you should think is, well, this is how it is, obviously. And there's my NP bubble here on the outside. And there's a few, this kind of complexity, if you want. There are a few P problems down here. There are a few NP complete problems up here. And these can be used to just get all the others, solutions for all the others. Yeah. In particular, if uh, this intersection here would be non-trivial, or something like this, uh, then actually P needs to be NP because then you can reduce everything to a P problem. It's kind of the point. So NP, so P uh, intersection NP complete is empty if and only if P is equal to NP. So if it turns out to be this way, then this is just what it is. Everything is just NP complete. Everything is just a bubble. And this is probably how it is without the green one. So the green one ruins everything here. Um, but otherwise, this is probably how it is. Right? So say it again, NP complete problems are those that you could use to simulate every other problem. So if you can solve an NP complete problem, you can use the solution to create solutions for all other problems. And OK, I showed you, and an, uh, it's relatively easy to come up with a NP problem, jigsaw, for example. It's reasonably easy to come up with a P problem, quicksort, for example. But this looks crazy to me, like a problem if you can find a solution, you can solve all the others. Um, it, it's not clear to me why this should exist, okay? So it's not clear to me why this should be empty. Uh, absolutely not. And that's exactly the theorem. It's not empty. There is a problem, which I'm going to run for you in a second. It's called three satisfiability. So the S three sat, and it's NP complete. And actually, there was an analysis um, 
which is actually also a pretty cool theorem. So you could push it down to, it still runs in exponential time, so 1.3 to the n, uh, but it's not so bad maybe. But the point is, this was the first problem that was shown to be um, NP-complete, and there is an NP-complete problem. And then there was kind of a zoo of NP-complete problems. It's, it's, it's amazing. So first, just from the definition, it looks like absolutely nothing is NP-complete. NP I mean, come on. A problem that is so interesting, it's so hard to solve, that kind of all, if you have a solution, you can solve all others. Why should that exist, right? And people proved in the 70s, without having the notion of NP-completeness, by the way, which is very impressive, um, that this thing actually exists. And then there was a whole zoo of them. And nowadays, there are a lot of them. And all of them are kind of reduced to um, this, this problem itself. So because this is NP-complete, if you now want to show that traveling salesman is NP-complete, you just need to show that this one implies this one, right? So whatever here. In this case, this guy here. There are various versions of the same same problem. So let's discuss it. Actually, it's because it's a fun game. It's it's a game like Jigsaw, and it basically works as follows. There's some boolean blah 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 involved, but let's just have a look at the online uh, version of the game, which we can run. So this one here, which you can run together, or you can run it yourself. Link is in the description. So here's the game. So basically, that's how it works. So we it's called three because we have three inputs here, and the uh, um, the aim of the game, you, you win if every one of those has one, one green box. And I can get green boxes by clicking on a symbol. So I will click on three, and then all threes get green, and all minus threes get red. And I said again, it's a point to get, well, let's click on minus four. All minus fours get green, all fours get red. And the, you win the game if you are managed to get uh, only green boxes, uh, at least one green box per, uh, what is it, per row. So here, let's click on six, uh, doing very well here. Let's click on seven, uh, let's click on nine, and congratulations, I have won. But this was, of course, a very, very easy one. And now let's do the very, very hard one here. Um, <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, let's just randomly click on seven. Very good. Uh, minus one looks good. Oops, I'm in trouble here. So let's click on four. I'm in trouble here. Let's click on five. Oh, I'm doing very well. I'm surprised. Uh, here, I need a two. Oops, I'm in trouble here. A three. Ooh, uh, ooh. Ah, this looks very bad. So if I click here, uh, let's see. Oh, oops, I lost. Um, so, and the point is, as you can see, this game is small, but let's go to the easy one. Let's go back to the easy one. Um, with a, a lot of these little boxes, if I'm just doing the straightforward clicking here, I probably will lose. Um, so here's one missing, I have one. Uh, if I just click randomly, I probably will lose, but certainly there is a way to get a potential solution by just clicking randomly. So this is certainly an NP problem. Turns out that it's also NP complete. I hope the kind of game here is was clear. Uh, it's basically a game and you wonder whether there is an easy way to get a solution. And there is just none um, because of the, if you click on three somewhere, then somewhere else there will be a minus three that gets red and then it gets a, a big mess. Anyway, this was the first problem that was found to be NP complete. So um, this picture is actually true. And there's a theorem which I haven't told you. So this picture is really true. You can also show that under this assumption, that there are problems which are really here. So they're neither NP, ENP complete nor P, but again, only under this assumption. Anyway, so this is probably the picture how it really is. Because as I said, at least I don't believe that this has a chance to be true. Recognizing a chair is not the same as building a chair, but okay. Uh, anyway, so um, why is that so hard? So it, it sounds like it's obviously wrong. At least to me, it sounds like this is obviously wrong. Come on. So you should be able to prove it. And I give you three reasons why I, at least I think um, this is so hard. And these are stolen from uh, the nice article that I link in the description. There are actually a few more reasons in that article, but these were the, at least for me, the most convincing ones. So first is this one here. It's, it's very strange, very similar looking problems can have very different complexities. So finding a two coloring of a, of a graph is a problem you could solve in polynomial time. Finding a three coloring of a graph is a problem that you can reduce to uh, this guy here. So in the end, this is an NP-complete problem. 
So that's very strange, right? It's just a two versus three coloring and they change completely their uh, complexity clause. And that's a huge problem if you want to prove something in general, because just mildly modifying your problem will end up with very different answers. Uh, that's usually not very good to write down a proof. And part two is they are really crazily, amazingly clever ways to avoid brute force approaches. So sometimes it's like, what on earth this problem is, so we are this one, for example, what on earth this problem is solvable in polynomial time? That doesn't really look like it. And a huge class of such problems is, for example, everything you can do by linear programming is solvable in polynomial time. And that's a huge class of problems where it's absolutely not clear a priori why they should be in P. I said again, um, kind of related to my jigsaw again, it's relatively easy to see that something is in NP, but then getting a hand on its complexity, that's very tricky, and but gets stuck quite, quite easily. And then it's very surprising sometimes you have so clever answers. And again, that, that kind of makes it hard to prove something in general. And the last one, is that complexity clauses kind of vary a lot and they are hard to determine precisely. So even for something extremely silly like matrix multiplication, that's not so clear. You would think matrix multiplication is clearly of order n cubed, right? You have uh, n times n squared equations that you need to solve. So it's definitely of order n cubed. Uh, the last one I found is actually that uh, it's roughly about uh, it's way, way faster. You can do it in roughly n to the 2.4, which is really way, way faster than n cubed. And a lot of people suspect that you can actually do it in n squared, which is really way, way faster than a, 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 a n cubed. And we're talking about matrix multiplication here. Even for matrix multiplication, first of all, it's surprising what kind of answer you get. I mean, Faster than n cubed is really strange. It sounds really weird to me. There's a famous Strassen algorithm, algorithm which does it faster, and you can modify that a little bit, and you go down to 2.4. Then it's very hard to determine kind of the minimal or the, the, the most efficient algorithm. So right now we are down here to roughly 2.4. The last time I checked, um, but people suspect that it might be doable in n squared, which is, by the way, a ridiculous result in itself. Matrix multiplication just appears everywhere. And if you could push it from n cubed to n squared, that has some applica implications for machine learning, for example. Mach in machine learning, you usually mu need to multiply huge matrices. And it makes a huge difference if you have something n cubed, n is the number of rows and columns, or if you have something n squared. Anyway, that was a little bit matrix off topic here. So P equals NP, if you ignore that it's really a restricted problem, uh, like it's never catching, it's never telling you anything about quantum computers, analog computers, for example, or biological computers. Let's assume, for example, our brain is a biological computer. Not quite clear, obviously, because the brain is too complicated. But but then, for example, n uh, not equals or not equal NP doesn't say anything about that case, for example, or quantum computers, maybe whatever. But anyway, it's kind of a very silly and very simple question, um, and with an obvious answer. Of course, it's not the same. Yeah, say it again. Building a chair is certainly not the same as recognizing it. But it's so ridiculously hard to prove. And I think basically it is so hard to prove because it's kind of hard to nail down complexity classes. It's kind of easy to say roughly where they should be, but to nail something down explicitly is really, really, really tough. And that might be the reason why it is so hard to prove. But maybe at one point we'll have a proof. I don't think this will happen anytime soon, but who knows? Uh, time can prove me wrong. That's very easy. Uh, whatever. I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.